You know that feeling you get when you're texting with someone and it's going great and then that little bubble comes up, the one with the three dots, and you're just waiting, waiting for the response. And even if it's been like three seconds, it's taking forever. What are they thinking? What are they about to say? You start creating these stories in your head. Fuck, am I coming on too strong? Did I sound disingenuous? God, why was I myself? God, why did I wear that color scrunchie? I knew it, she hates me. That's basically what happened with Carla. And I tried to be chill, but on the inside, I was bugging out. I think I like I wrote you this letter about wanting to work with you and that I thought you were so special and that I, I I loved your voice and really you are one of the people that has been able to express a lot of my experiences and kind of what I feel into words <laughs> but but that girl who that's inside me like that girl who is my like my trauma I guess mm-hmm. was like she thinks you're stupid. She doesn't think you're good enough. She doesn't like you. And I'm like, oh, I was like brooding. And I remember I was like, but she's on IG. So like, I'm sure she saw (laughs) my message. I just did not know how to respond. That's Carla. I wanted to think of you as not a celebrity, but as a person who was coming into my life. And I wanted to honor that and respect that. And so I didn't Mm -hmm. want to gush. I didn't want to make you feel like I was a fan, but I also wanted to respect the, the glass ceilings you'd shattered and the path you'd carved for us. So it was a lot to consider, you know? So you can hear why I'm so taken by Carla. She's thoughtful and considerate and deeply empathic and she can see right through your corniness. Carla, you use the term dream and I want to ask you something. Throughout your book, The Undocumented Americans, you continually take issue with language. You stop and you pause and you interrogate the terms that we now take for granted. One of those terms, a term that you seem to hate, is dreamer. You uh, would be counted as a dreamer, uh, an undocumented student brought here young, uh, but you don't like that term. How come? Why don't you like dreamer? Look at me. It's not punk rock. It's corny. But also, it's um, propaganda. Um, I would be okay with the term dreamer if it was, if dream was um, capitalized to show that it's an acronym for the dream act. Um, But it's not, it's now lowercase to show that it's like uh, a descriptor of an effective experience, which means that you are a person who dreams. And in literature, a person who has a lifelong dream tends to be a tragic figure because they don't achieve the dream. Um, And that just tends to be the case. And I'm not that kind of person. That's why I love her. (laughs) And it's what makes her such an extraordinary writer and person. And so much of that comes from her lived experience and because she's a fucking genius. I love how honest she is and I aspire to be like her. I'm Diane Guerrero, and yeah, no, I'm not okay. This week, a voice of our generation, Carla Cornejo Villavicencio. So as soon as I got this show, I knew I had to talk to Carla. Her book, The Undocumented Americans, had me so shook. I had never read a book that told a story I connected with so deeply. And I had never heard the undocumented experience told quite like this. But first, I want Carla to tell you about herself. I was born in Ecuador and grew up in New York City 
in Brooklyn and in Queens. I grew up undocumented. Uh, my parents are still undocumented. I am now a permanent resident. My younger brother is a citizen. He was born in Brooklyn. He's very Brooklyn. I am 31, so I grew and came of age at a time before DACA. And so things were a little different then. And so I was like a very gifted student and all of that. Part of it was just like natural talent. I was really good with language. I was just also like really competitive and ambitious and wanted to be number one all the time. But also from an early age, I knew that I needed to be super, super successful if my parents were going to make it out alive. And I also knew because the narrative was everywhere that grades were the thing that were going to get me out of the hood. Mm -hmm. Like it was like dancing basketball or grades and it was going to be grades for me, you know? (laughs) And I ended up going to Harvard and I was one of the first undocumented immigrants uh, accepted into Harvard or, or maybe graduated from Harvard. Uh, And I think maybe like the first cohort you know, that was accepted and graduated from Harvard. And um, it was really crazy because there was, they called us international students. So we would go to like events where it was like international students from China and they were really wealthy and we had nothing in common and they treated us the same administratively. In 2010, Carla published an essay in the Daily Beast called I'm an Illegal Immigrant at Harvard. It was published anonymously during her senior year, and in it, she talks about the deep fear and trauma she has felt through her young life as an undocumented person living in the United States. After that essay came out, Carla was asked to write a memoir by several literary agents, but she turned them all down. She was only 21. And she knew that the story they wanted was that stereotypical, inspirational one about the poor, sad immigrant girl who miraculously pulled herself up by her bootstraps, bootstraps, bootstraps. So she said no thanks. And instead, she kept on the academic path, though not entirely by choice. And then I went to Yale for a PhD because I couldn't work. And for Yale, you didn't, you didn't need a social. And I didn't want to do a PhD. I wanted to go back to New York and work in magazines, but I couldn't do that. And I appreciated the health insurance because I was really depressed. And um, yeah, and so I've been living in New Haven for the past 10 years. And I basically used my time at Yale to learn as much as possible and to use the time to write. And so I've been writing professionally since I was 15 years old. I started writing about music. And then when Trump won in 2016, I knew I was the best person to write about immigration in the way that I wanted to write about it, which was Mm. like unapologetic, really examining what illegality means to a person, aside from just like breaking the law equals bad. Because like, the way that I think about it, like all of the American dream icons, like the Kennedys, the Godfather trilogy, Andrew Carnegie, Jay Gatsby, all of those folks, like bootleggers, mobsters, just absolute people who made their lives in the informal economy. Like Americans fucking love heist movies, mm. movies about underground, like crime. But if an immigrant uses a fake social, God fucking forbid. They should be deported. They should be killed. They should be shot in the head. You read that in the comment sections. And it's like, well, that's actually antithetical to the American dream story. Because the American dream story is about committing crimes in order for your family to get ahead and in order to create generational wealth. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, I need to say that. And people weren't saying that before me. Uh, People were just like, I mean, immigrant writers, because they were writing for white audiences. They were saying, please accept us. We really want to be citizens. We really want to be Americans. We love America, red, white, and blue. And I was just like, this is dehumanizing. I love America. I love the English language. It's my language. This is my country. I'm like New Yorker. I'm I'm from Brooklyn. I'm from Queens. I'm so fucking proud 
Um, but also I don't have to turn myself into a caricature to demand respect. And so I wrote a book and I was the first undocumented person to be nominated for a National Book Award. And Barack Obama uh, recommended my book as his one of his favorite books of 2020, which was surprised a lot of people because <laughs> the dedication of my book is Chinga la Migra, which means fuck ice. And I haven't commented publicly on that, but I think I understand why he chose it. And sure. uh, presidents don't apologize. Doctors don't apologize. And I understand why they don't, because it, it would all crumble if they did. But him using his name to back up my book, I think says something about what he thought about his administrations and their mm -hmm. policies on immigration. And also the fact that my book is like a book where I say, I'm not going to talk about dreamers. This is about their parents who get no attention, who get no love, who get no respect. And Obama, it was the DACA president. That was his great mm -hmm. achievement. And mm -hmm. so I, I think his support of my book just said something. And I'm not going to say what he said, but I think it says something, you know? Mm. Yeah. Looking back, it was hard to reconcile that Obama was separating record numbers of families and mm -hmm. perpetuating the good immigrant, bad immigrant narrative, which is why I think your book is so important. Like, I'm dyslexic, okay? <laughs> it's very hard for me to sit down and read a book, and yet yours was so clear to me. I'm really proud of that because – you know, in go going through grad school, like people just really love language that's inaccessible mm -hmm. and like theory and academic language. And I just never fucked with that because I was just like, I want a book that like, that's just, that's just for the people, you know? And <laughs> um, my book is smart. My book is full of references. My book is just like, you know, how people used to say like 30 Rock had like, 30 jokes a minute or something like that. Like, that's the energy my book has. Mm -hmm. But, like, some people call it a YA book, too, because, like, teenagers can read it. Like, adults can read it. Um, I've had non-native English speakers who are undocumented read and immigrants read it. Um, it's just a really accessible book. And the stories are just, like, not, like, really depressing, so you use this phrase in some of your writing, including a recent piece you did for The New Yorker that's called Waking Up from the American Dream. You call yourself a professional daughter of immigrants. And that really resonated with me. I'm, I'm going to read a little excerpt from that piece. In my teens, I began to specialize. I became a performance artist. I accompanied my parents to places where I knew they would be discriminated against and where I could ensure their rights would be granted. If a bank teller wasn't accepting their ID, I'd stroll in an oversized Forever 21 blazer, red lipstick, a slick back bun, and fresh Stan Smiths. I bought a pleather folder and made sure my handshake broke bones. Sometimes I appealed to decency, sometimes to law, sometimes to God. Sometimes I leaned back in my chair like a sexy gangster and said, so you tell me how you want my mom to survive in this country without a bank account. You close at four, but I have all the time in the world. Then I'd wink. It was vaudeville, but it worked. Whew. That made me think about how we feel like we have to be our family's saviors. And sometimes they're caretakers and kind of because we have to be, but it's ultimately a feeling that if it goes to the extreme, it doesn't serve us. And I wonder, how do you combat that urge? Um, I don't, I don't combat it. <laughs> I mean, I still do it. I, I just have uh, more boundaries with my parents um, mm -hmm. because of my mental health. Mm -hmm. I realized that, um, Talking to them very regularly is a great trigger to my mental health. So I've just cut down on communication. So I still check in on them, make sure they're doing well. Um, 
I asked them if they need money um, because obviously mm-hmm. the pandemic has hit hard um, mm-hmm. the service industry and that's where they work. And um, I still provide for my mom and, you know, she gets sick sometimes. She needs medicines. She needs she needs support. But aside from that, I don't check in on the regular to chit chat very much because I know it's going to become a conversation that I have learned to not expect more from, you know, Mm -hmm. it's been a long time where I I tried to change them, where I tried to explain to my mom that certain things she says, she said were hurtful. And then I realized what I've learned in therapy, which is that I'm the skillful one and she doesn't have those tools. And Mm -hmm. so I made boundaries. And with my father, I am not ready to deal with, with, just everything that I have to deal with in order to reestablish a healthy relationship with him right now, because my priority is healing and mental health, uh, just in an SOS day to day basis Mm. and my work right now. And he is maybe the number one source of, of panic in my life, because just like you've said, I've had a relationship with my mom that is just isn't as close and I've just absolutely worshipped my father my entire life, which has allowed me to not really examine the ways in which he's used that love and that trust and that worship to um, be emotionally abusive or to mm-hmm. lie or to exercise his, his machismo and his toxic masculinity in ways that I allowed because I thought he was a martyr. And so I sort of put that on the shelf for now. And I said, it's best for me to just not talk to you for, you know, unless it's the check-in. And so it it was just boundaries. Mm -hmm. I'm still there for them. I know that they won't be evicted. I know that they won't go hungry. I know that they're they're always going to have um, me to advocate for them with health care, with anything that they need. But that doesn't mean that they're allowed to um, intrude on my days and my emotional state of mind whenever Mm -hmm. they want to. I feel that so much. And those are boundaries that I'm trying to create at the moment with my folks, you know, and as much as they they push back so much on these boundaries because they don't understand them, I I'm just starting to realize in some of the ways that my dad isn't perfect, you know, just because my mom. My, my mom and I had such uh, such a difficult relationship, you know, I kind of looked to him as the one who really understood me and, you know, no, like, dude, you need boundaries too. Both of you do. And there's this term called mentalizing, which means like you put yourself in someone else's shoes basically and like think about or mind and like think about what they must be thinking about or going through and experiencing. She has no interest. My dad has no interest. Like, I'm constantly like, I wonder why my father was cruel and crazy. I wonder why my mom is such a narcissist. And then I think back to their childhoods and their life in America and all of their hardships. And I'm like, that makes sense. It's intergenerational trauma and migration trauma. And then I move mm-hmm. on. But they mm-hmm. don't do that to me. Mm-hmm. And so, like, my my mom is just like, yeah, I guess I wish your father was dead and, you know, COVID was a missed opportunity. And I'm like, he is my father. And it causes me panic to think he could die. And you should think that I am your daughter. Like, do you remember that I am your daughter? And they don't. Because, like, Mm -hmm. once you achieve a certain level of success and once you are grown, they Mm -hmm. feel like, they do. They feel like, well, we did our job. Now you have to take care of every single one of our traumas. And it's up to us to push back because if we don't, they really will take it to God knows where. I'm learning in therapy that boundaries equal love and that's something I keep telling myself. And I think that that constant boundary crossing in relationships with our parents affects like every relationship we try to have, be it romantic or platonic. Like I've always had an especially hard time making friends with other women, like where we are healthy and cultivating success and lifting each other up. And 
maybe being best friends for her fucking ever. I have lots of like female friendships in a sense, but all of my closest friends are guys. Mm. And I don't know why that is. Um, and I think like a lot of women, it's like pretty common when they're to be said like, don't trust a woman who doesn't have women friends. Mm-hmm. And it's just, it's just sort of happened. And so when a woman does approach me and want to be my friend, I am so confused. And then like, I don't know how to act. I'm like, should I be myself? Because like myself is really weird. I think something that I've always longed for, like women connection, female connection and and relationships with women because my relationship with my mother is so strained, I think. I mean, I'm, believe me, I love my mother. We, we talk often, but we have a strained relationship. Like we're fighting a lot. And um, so when it comes to female friendships, I try everything in my power not to argue, not to find myself in a position where I have to fight with them because I will lose them. And you know, 100% of the time I end up losing them because I'm overly like, I'm sorry, and did I do something wrong? Or I defer to them even in times where they have wronged me and I should stick up for myself and say, hey, that's not okay. And like in order to move on and, and continue being friends, we must unpack this. I mean, that's why I wanted you to be one of my guests on this pod because I I really do think you're a freaking incredible person. I and and I know you don't like this, but I really do think that you are one of the freaking greatest writers of our generation, and I'm only here to offer my friendship. I really appreciate that. That's really kind. Um, I also think I'm one of the great writers of my generation. Oh, wonderful! But, you know, the only thing I want from you is your friendship, because you know what it's like to achieve certain markers of success and Mm. to just feel like the loneliest girl in the world. I think once you reach certain goals for yourself that you've had for a long time, it can feel pretty empty. And there are not a lot of people who can necessarily um, share the experiences that we've had. Mm -hmm. Um, and, And we've had different experiences, but there's some overlap. And they're incredibly lonely. And I think it's in those moments where people feel like nobody understands that you resort to um, behaviors that are Mm self-harming. And that's definitely happened to me um, all my life, but especially in the past couple of years where I would meet certain goals that I had and I would be like, I feel completely empty. And there's nobody that I can talk to right now because like my phone is filled with people that I just wouldn't understand. And um, and so I think once you meet someone that, that you like and that you think is a good person and that, and that you just think might understand, I think that's just, I mean, that's how you form your, your chosen family, right? Mm-hmm. And like as a queer person, chosen family is so important. And I think as, as, you know, when you belong to a family of immigrants, there's people who have mixed status. But as you know, sometimes people are deported. Sometimes people move for work sometimes people have to go underground and chosen family is important there too you have Mm -hmm. like aunties you have people that you call aunties who are not aunties you have like people who sell like you know your favorite food from the local restaurant and like that's the only food you can eat when you're sick like that's chosen family too Mm -hmm. so those are the people that sort of keep you alive you know um and so i i think that that's that's really special when you find someone that you feel like you can be yourself around because Mm -hmm. so much of what allows people like us to be successful is performativity. Mm. Like you create a persona when you're, when you're young. I wrote about Mm. that um, in a piece for the New Yorker this week. When you feel like you have to protect your family or your community or yourself, you form a persona. And a lot of that is a lot of armor And some of that is, you know, vaudeville. And Mm -hmm. you just stick to that persona. And at some point, you do have to ask yourself, like, who am I really? Mm. And you do have to find people who know you for who you really truly are and who still love you for that. It's not easy being breezy. 
Carla tells us more after the break. So, Carla, babe, you've been really open about your mental health struggles. Can you talk a little bit about that? What do you want to know? <laughs> I want to know how know? you did it. How um, you... <laughs> I'm, I'm, I just hate fucking saying this because it sounds so goop, but I'm on my healing journey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so the, the mental health journey... First, I'll speak sort of generally, which is that through my research, I found out that um, it was not just me and that so many, especially older immigrants, aging immigrants, suffer from a lot of PTSD, depression, anxiety, and because obviously they don't have mental health resources available to them, they self-medicate. But the thing that people love about immigrants is that we're hardworking, right? And so, yeah, these um, these people struggle with these horrific nightmares and they like they need to drink in order to be able to sleep and all of that, but they don't miss a day, they don't take a sick day. They're able to deal with their mental illnesses and mental health issues while still like looking bright, happy, yes sir, yay. Yeah, yes ma'am and being high functioning and so um i found out that you know in a lot of the interviews that i did that that was like kind of an immigrant thing a lot of children of immigrants so much ptsd so much self-harm a lot of self-punishing behaviors mm -hmm. that our parents mm -hmm. don't have because we feel guilty like there's so much guilt and so much shame and so much pressure to save ourselves, save our families, save our communities. And obviously we're gonna fall short. And so then we do self-punishing behaviors. And then we feel guilty about that. And so we'll do more self-punishing behaviors, but we still show up on time. We still meet our deadlines. We still pay our taxes. We still, you know? And so the idea that like society has of like someone who's like, who needs help, is not of like a dreamer who's just like has everything under control. And that's why it was important for me to be public about my mental illness. Mm -hmm. So the way that my psychiatrists have sort of talked to me about this is symptoms and not diagnoses. But as a writer, like a diagnosis is very comforting to me because mm -hmm. I can read about it. And I, uh, I, I like having the ability to do research. And so I've been misdiagnosed for many, many years. And um, I was talking to a researcher at Yale who studies borderline personality disorder. And she told me that it's actually standard practice among a lot of psychiatrists to misdiagnose people who have borderline personality disorder and tell them that, they, that they're bipolar because mm. the stigma with BPD is so great that it might do more harm to just tell them that they have BPD. And so they'll just tell them they're bipolar and then just be like, recommend therapies for BPD. Um, so I was di misdiagnosed as bipolar for many years. And I was like, I don't have like manic episodes. I, um, I stay up all night writing because I'm a writer. And of course, my um, mostly white psychiatrists were like, no, staying up all night to write just, that seems manic, right? And so... I was never asked about my migration history, about my past, about sexual abuse, about what it was like to be undocumented or to like hide from ICE during like when you knew they were conducting raids in your neighborhood. That's fucking mm -hmm. scary and traumatic. Mm -hmm. And so it would be like I would have certain experiences at night that would be called hallucinations. And if they had really dug in, they would have understood. Sometimes ICE had raids and they were at night because they disappear you in the middle of the night. And if I wake up screaming in the middle of the night, thinking that I saw something, 
maybe it has to do with that and not because I'm in have a like in a state of psychosis when right. nothing else indicates that that's the case. So after many years, I had a psychiatrist of color who was like, oh, you have borderline personality disorder. And that fit perfectly based on my experiences. Basically, um, I'm an extremely sensitive person. And like, if you yelled at me right now, I would just completely be devastated. The rest of my day would be ruined. I would I would just feel like like a wilted orchid. Whereas if I was just a person who was more neurotypical, I would be like, why are you yelling at me? That's weird and inappropriate. But if you yelled at me, I would just, I would just, I would just, it would just be the most devastating thing that could happen to me. Mm-hmm. It's uh, Marsha Linehan, who is the person, the scientist who created the gold standard therapy, behavioral therapy for the personality disorder because no medicine exists for it. She calls it people who walk around like they have third degree burns all over their body. Like everything, everything hurts, everything hurts. And so I walked around my life with everything hurting. Like if I saw a person and they had like a string loose in one of the buttons on their coat, it made me feel like immediately suicidal. Mm. And part of that, sure, made me a good writer because I could notice details at that level and notice how that could be sad. And and I could write about that. And that makes me like an intuitive, empathic writer. No, it is not a gift. It is based on early trauma that I had based on separation from my parents and on the fact that the people who raised me when I was a toddler in Ecuador probably weren't responding when I was showing that I was scared or or I was crying. And of course, this lifetime of growing up undocumented, in poverty, often hungry, and with a father who had a completely erratic temper. Mm -hmm. So I was lucky enough to get the diagnosis. And I started reading about it, and it made sense. And so the thing that helps with the diagnosis is skills. And the skills are called DBT, and that's the program that I'm doing now three times a week for three hours a day. And I absolutely love it. What's DBT? So DBT is called Dialectical Behavioral Therapy. And it is a therapy that is sort of based on different behavioral techniques and also loosely based on like Zen Buddhism. So it Mm -hmm. sounds like a cult. And once you go into it, it feels like a cult because it's a lot of acronyms. Mm -hmm. I think it teaches you how to regulate your emotions. So something is, uh, when you and I started talking, I told you I was winding down from feeling like an injustice had happened to me. Mm -hmm. And so that, if I feel disrespected, I immediately become hot and angry. And something that DBT teaches you are like tip skills, which um, can't tell you what the acronym stands for. But uh, one thing you can do is like you can like hold ice in your hands until mm-hmm. your hands become too cold, painfully cold. Or you can put like ice in your mouth or you can take a freezing cold shower. And that is supposed to produce the same amount of discomfort and pain that you would as if you were harming yourself. Mm. And, but it stops your emotions. It stops your like angry, fiery, hot emotions where you would be like, I want to engage in negative behaviors. Um, and it, it, it works. Um, I have an ice hat, which you've seen on Instagram, <laughs> where it's like, it's just a hat full of ice. I have it in the freezer. And when I'm feeling just overwhelmed by emotion, I put it on, I lie in bed, I listen to music, and within like 10 minutes, I've calmed down. And that helps me make a rational decision. Because if you make a decision when you're really hot-headed, it's not going to go well. And so like another skill that like you can learn in DBT is, for example, how to deal with a confrontation with someone and to do it skillfully, where you're not threatening them, where they're not being emotionally abusive to you, if someone is being emotionally abusive to you, how to respond while preserving your self-respect, 
while keeping long-term goals in mind and not compromising them for short-term goals, which is really important for someone like me, who's always like, I'm going to say this really cutting, biting, witty thing that's going to just like tell them off because it's because I'm right. And so DBT is like, sometimes it's better to be efficient than to be right. Ooh. And it's like, yes, mm. I don't want to burn this bridge, even though I know I'm right. So I'm just going to stay silent. Mm-hmm. Or I'm just going to just like communicate my displeasure in another way. It's fantastic skills. It's scientifically proven to help people with borderline personality disorder or eating disorders, um, all sorts of you know different disordered behaviors like that. It really helps them and it really helps with suicidality. And so, yeah, when I started being open about having BPD, there was really nobody who was public about it because it's so stigmatized. There was just nobody who was high profile or any kind of profile who was open about having BPD um, and who was also successful because Mm -hmm. people who have BPD are said to not be able to hold down jobs, have intimate relationships, maybe never get married, and just constantly be in and out of hospital. And because I wasn't on any of those things, but, but I was doing so much hard work, I felt it was important for me to just share about all the work I was doing to better myself, but also show that I still had a sense of humor about it, that I still called myself crazy, that I still (laughs) embraced this aspect of myself, and just to share of myself because representation does matter, and for mental illness, it matters too. Mm Mm-hmm. I know so many people can relate to what you're talking about from misdiagnosis to not understanding why one resorts to negative behaviors. And I personally experience both those feelings. Like I really think I could benefit from DBT. And maybe it could help a lot of other folks out there. We will be leaving some resources in the episode notes for you guys. Whoever is interested, please, please, please click on those resources. I mean, it is so helpful, but you do have to do the work. And so something Mm -hmm. I learned that I thought of is that I used to tell myself like during the pandemic, like be gentle with yourself, like just be gentle with yourself. And then I realized that I was telling myself to be gentle and interpreting it as not doing the work. So I would just be like, be gentle with yourself. I'm going to lay down in bed and just watch a lot of YouTube videos. And I was like, that's not being gentle with myself. I was like, I'm going to be gentle with myself. So I'm going to meditate even though I don't want to. Or like, I'm going to be gentle with myself and I'm going to paint uh, like a portrait of a friend's dog while not being high. You know, mm. like those things are being gentle too, even though they're they're n- not necessarily what I want to do. Um, right. And sometimes doing something that's hard is is the gentler option on yourself. Oh, I love that. I really love that. You talked about how family separation has damaging effects on the brain. I was separated from my family when I was fourteen. But before that, the being afraid all the time about being separated and just the inevitability of it all was so damaging. Yeah. And we've seen more research on this recently with the children separated at the border. Can you talk about that? People have no idea, like, what this is going to look like for generations to come. Mm -hmm. Like they just have no idea. And part of it is because those of us who have been through it don't really want to talk about the mental health issues we experience because that seems like blaming our parents. That seems like not being good representatives of the Latinx community or the immigrant community. That seems like airing our dirty laundry. You know, this piece that I wrote for The New Yorker Several people said to me that, like, like it might not be the best idea to write it, like Latinx people, because they said that it was, like, our story, and it was private, and it was shameful. 
Mm. And I was like, it's, we, I mean, the children of immigrants, we carry so much baggage and the most we do to acknowledge it is to make memes about it. But we don't talk about how painful it really is to just get through a day and if you get a text from your mom or dad, you just immediately go into a panic. And we're dealing with like nervous systems that like, it's as if we came back from war. And we don't talk about it because we've been so preoccupied with fighting for basic decency for ourselves and for the dreamers and for our parents and for the kids who are, you know, separated from their parents at the border. There hasn't been room in the discourse for us to be like, by the way, like I've been doing okay, you know, like I'm pretty successful, but by the way, this fucked me up for life. Um, because people would blame our parents, but we are not talking or writing to right wingers who are going to take anything we say and twist it. We're talking to each other, you know? We have mm -hmm. to stop thinking about racist white people as our audience and mm -hmm. start thinking about each other as our audience. And this is a conversation we need to have because it's a crisis. Like the number of immigrants who are successful or children of immigrants who are successful, who have reached out to me with suicidal thoughts is alarming. And mm -hmm. they can't, they reach out to me because they can't reach out to anybody else because that would be like betraying their image and their cause. And so I feel like it's so important to talk about that amongst ourselves and to have like safe spaces where we can talk amongst ourselves. And yeah, to write about it so that if white people read that, they know, look, we're not here to be your decorative dolls. Your votes, your, uh, your unwillingness to vote or whatever mm -hmm. it is affects us and will affect us for generations because these kids are citizens. You know, we're a community and, and like they'll be in class with your children. It's just, it just, it's a mental health crisis. It's a public, it's a public health crisis and nobody wanted to talk about it. And so that's what alarmed me so much is that I got so many messages when I started being open about this from young people who would be like, I can't be open about this. I can't talk about this. I don't know how to talk about this. And I was like, there's so many of us out there and with the policies of the last several years, there's just so many more. And I hope that by the time, you know, the younger kids who have experienced these things are a little bit older, there's enough of us talking, writing, having TV shows, movies, that mm. shows them that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. How can we start caring, and this is a big question, how can we start caring for the mental health of, of undocumented folks? I think it really does start with yourself and caring for your own mental health and figuring out why it's like such a tough puzzle and it's such a tough um, like rubric, rubrics cube for, for, for yourself, you know? I think mm -hmm. that I, um, I wrote about mental health for a long time before I was willing to really address my own. And I um, I wasn't ready. I remember at the beginning of my press tour for the Undocumented Americans, I would like, like show all of the books that my partner had bought me uh, that were books about healing and DBT and chronic trauma and all of that. And I would be like, my partner buys me these books, but I'm not ready yet. And now I, now I'm ready. Now I'm like in this full time and I'm largely off of social media because people have not been nice and because I don't, I don't want to think of myself as a Sims character, which I already do as someone who writes about my life and it's consumed by people and someone who, um, disassociate sometimes, you know, mm -hmm. I want to just kind of be in the present more. Um, mm -hmm. But I do also, you know, want 
to share with my uh, readers and, and be engaged and all of that. I'm just figuring stuff out and I want to be honest with people. I think honesty is important. And I think like when people are like, I'm taking some time for self care and then they like, it's like a face mask and a matcha. It's like, I love face masks and matcha so much, but like, that's not really self care for if you have experienced systemic violence. Like, self care is like, here is my heavy ass workbook. Here is some, here's my, here's a notebook where I'm going to write down my triggers and what I'm going to do in response to them. My phone is off, so nobody can interrupt me for this one hour. I've lit a candle with a non-triggering smell. (laughs) And I'm going to say, like, for the next two days, I will not drink. Or for the next two days, I will not cut myself or whatever and it doesn't have to be like a long-term goal like sometimes I will be like wake up and be like I will be sober forever and like that's <laughs> just not how life works but just do it for like a day or two to prove to yourself that you can do little things that make yourself proud and then once you start accomplishing those like little by little I think like I realized why the world loved me And then I started thinking, this is something that happened in my DBT class. They said, what do you like about yourself? And I was like, well, I like that I write well. And I was like, no, that's my career. And that's what people like about me. And then I was like, well, I like that I'm generous and I'm kind to people. And I was like, no, that's still about external validation and something that I could do for other people. Mm. And I was like, I couldn't think of something. I was like, I like that I'm funny. But that's still like, other people find me funny. And then I said, I like that dogs and animals feel safe with me, which is something that I really do value in myself and I think is special. And that um, has nothing to do with race or immigration status or anything. And like when there's a dog that runs away in my neighborhood, my partner like calls out for me and I come out just wearing a mask like nothing else and like sometimes the dogs like (laughs) bare their teeth at me and I just like lay down and they come to me and I don't feel fear because I'm like the worst they can do is bite me but I don't want them to get hit by a car and like part of that is like yes I'm crazy because they could maul me but like like I always help them come home to their parents and I like that about myself and it's like For all of those uh, who are children of immigrants or immigrants who feel like they need to succeed in order to save the fucking world, make a list of why the world likes you. Make a list of why you like yourself. It'll probably look different. Oh, my. What do I like about myself? You know, I was just thinking, like, I became a permanent resident this year, and I'm probably going to be – okay, this is, like, goth Carla, like, bringing up death again. But Give it to me. I'll probably be buried in America. And I'm like, I would just like to, because I know this is a lifelong journey. And the point wasn't going to Harvard or whatever, whatever. The point is like, I want like whoever outlives me to be like, she didn't die a broken person. She healed herself. Like all of the odds were against her. And she was supposed to be the girl who wrote about being broken. And she didn't do that and then she she healed herself and she died feeling peace and like that's what I'd like for all of us to just like be like you know what the entire like system of colonialism and imperialism and all of that has set it up so that we just have to swim against the current and just like work 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 and just like die exhausted in disgrace and it's like And for those of us artists, as you well know, it's like we have to like play roles or have images that are like subservient, really grateful all the time, Mm -hmm. really humble, perfect. And it's like, what if you do things your way, but you still are able to have peace? I think that's the greatest thing we could do for ourselves. And once people see that in us, they know it's possible for themselves too. I love you, Carla. Thank you so much. You're freaking amazing. Okay, love you. Bye, Mama. Bye. 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 
Yeah, No, I'm Not Okay is a production of LA Studios. Remember to rate and review our show. It helps other people find it. If you like it, share it with your friends. The more people we can get to have conversations about mental health, the better. If you've got a story you want to share about how you deal with mental health issues, send it my way. Record it on your phone's voice memo app and email it to yano at lastudios.com. And be sure to subscribe to our newsletter to get the latest episodes with a note from me, recommendations from our listeners and our team, and listener stories. Sign up at lastudios.com slash newsletters. Jessica Pilot is our talent manager and producer. Our executive producer is Leo G., Web designed by Andy Cheatwood and the digital and marketing teams at Southern California Public Radio. Thanks to the team at LA Studios, including Taylor Kaufman, Kristen Hayford, Kristen Muller, Michael Constantino, Robert Joe, Mildred Langford, and Leo G. A special thanks to you, Brian Crawford. This program is made possible in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. Additional support comes from the Angel Foundation, supporting transformational leaders, and by the California Healthcare Foundation, dedicated to improving the mental health care system for all Californians.